Good. Amen. Well, God is so good, isn't he? Thank you, Tom, for sharing that testimony, because that's what it's all about. He wants us to walk in healing. He wants us to be set free. He wants us delivered. He doesn't want us living in any kind of oppression. And, um, you know, one of the things that the Lord kept speaking to me all week is he says, I'm raising up an army of passionate warrior lovers for me, for him, not, not me, him, and that we are a victorious church and that God is breaking us out of any kind of passivity and any kind of slothfulness. And, and, uh, and so we're going to talk a little bit about that tonight. <clears throat> and so um, I'm just grateful that you're all here, you're watching online, because I know there's so many people who are so hungry for more, for the things of the Lord. Because Lord knows we don't want to stay stuck where we're at. I don't know about you, but Lord Jesus, if this is all there is, <laughs> you know, the church is supposed to be a church of signs, wonders, and miracles. And God is bringing us back to our original foundation. Amen? But it takes all of us. It's not just certain people. It's all of us pressing in. So praise the Lord. So, Lord, we just thank you. We, we were able to worship you. We're here. We have breath in our lungs, and we're healthy, Father. We, we are grateful. And, Lord, we just thank you for the word of the Lord Lord, your word says where, where your word is brought forth, the revelation of your word, it liberates us. And Lord, today we decree liberation. We decree freedom. We decree a turnaround, a shift in Jesus' name. Lord, we thank you for the power of your blood. And we thank you, oh God, that even tonight, even though we've heard, many of us have heard this before, we thank you for increased revelation. We thank you for strategies, Father, and that scales upon our eyes will be removed. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So the Lord told me to just go back and even share what the word salvation is. You know, when we all become born again, obviously, we know that there's salvation, right? And so I don't know. I'm sure many of you know this, but the word salvation is soteria. And um, <clears throat> in, in Acts chapter 1 of this, I mean, there's a lot of scriptures, but I just pick this one in Acts chapter 4 12 says now where there is salvation in any other for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved and so you know we're, we know he's talking about Jesus and that word salvation is soteria good and it means deliverance preservation safety salvation deliverance listen to this deliverance from the molestation of enemies so when we become born again when we get saved it's not just that we're going to heaven that's, that's the benefit, that's a bonus, but it's that we, the Lord is saying, I want you, I died on the cross for your deliverance, for your healing, for your preservation, for safety, for deliverance from molestation of any assignment that the enemy has uh, uh, released against you. That's, that's his game plan for us. But see, a lot of times we just stop at, I'm saved. See, but God's saying, no, 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 honey, you, you're not even step into pressing into all that I have for you. And the word saved, there in Luke chapter 19 10 it says for the son of man is come to seek and save that which is lost and that word saved is where we get the word sozo which means to save to rescue from danger or destruction or to deliver and I love this in Psalm 27 1 it says the Lord is my light and my salvation and in the Hebrew it's Yeshua y-e-s-h-a whom shall I fear and that word means liberty. He's my liberty. He's my deliverance. He's my rescuer. He's my welfare, my victory, my prosperity. It means to be saved in battle. That's what he's saying. The Lord is a light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? He's saying, oh, you are my liberty. You're my deliverer. He was a warrior. David was a mighty warrior. He knew how to fight, but he's saying, Lord, you're my liberation. You're my victor, because he knew that I'm not going to be a victorious warrior without him, without him guiding us, right? And so the Lord, what he's calling us all to is such a passion for Jesus, the zeal of the Lord. We cannot, we can't be carnal Christians. I mean, you can if you want, but you're not, it's not going to have, it's not going to get you through. I'm going to tell you that right now. In Romans 10, 9, it says, and we know the scripture that if you confess with your mouth, the Lord Jesus, and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be sozoed. You will be delivered. You will be kept safe. You will be rescued. And so I just love that. And so, 
So the, the gospel's never been separated. Salvation has never been separated from healings, from deliverances, from preservation. It's never been separated. The religious church did that. Not, never Jesus, okay? So deliverance, I feel, goes hand in hand with, uh, with evangelism. Because as we're evangelizing the people, we'll get words of knowledge and there's discerning of spirits that God will give us direction and guidance to minister to people and to set captives free, right? So in Matthew 10, 1 in the Amplified, it says, And Jesus, because I, I just want to again reiterate our authority, it says here, And Jesus summoned to him his 12 disciples and gave them power and authority over unclean spirits to drive them out and to cure all kinds of disease and all kinds of weakness and infirmity. That's us. Amen. And Jesus summoned to him. We are his disciples. And he gave them power, dunamis power, dynamite, explosive power and authority over, over unclean spirits. But see, if we don't know who we are in Christ and recognize the authority that we operate in, you know, again, we, we back off. And remember last week I spoke about open doors. We have to make sure the doors are shut and that we're not living a lifestyle like we want to. <laughs> you know, we have to live a lifestyle that, that the Lord, that's pleasing to the Lord because the enemy knows. We've been in deliverance meetings where the enemies called the person out if they were in sin. So... You need to live a holy life, okay? So Jesus gave us instruction to heal the sick, cleanse the leper, cast out devils, and raise the dead. And then in, Matthew, in Mark chapter 16, verse 17 in the Amplified, it says, And these attesting signs will accompany those who believe in my name. They will drive out demons, and they will speak in new languages. See, that, that's, that's one of the benefits that we have. So Jesus came to deliver us um, and, and remove the yoke of oppression and captivity from the hands of the enemy. See, he loves us too much. And, and we have to understand the full gospel of what he's called. But first of all, we're learning this for ourselves, but we're also learning this, how to know how to minister to other people. And I know a lot of us have been doing this anyhow. But, you know, in, in, in all the years I've been doing this, I always rehearse this and go over and over and over. And I'm always learning something new. And so in John, uh, 1 John 3, 8, it says here in the Amplified, But he who commits sin, who practices evil doing, is of the devil. Basta. <laughs> Takes his character from the evil one. For the devil has sinned, violated the divine law from the beginning. Now the reason the Son of God was made manifest, visible, was to undo, destroy, loosen, and dissolve the works the devil has done. Yeah. Has the devil done any works in your life? Or in your family, in your business, in the world, in people that we know? Hello. In government? We'll get in that in a minute. In Luke 10, 19, it says, I give you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Listen, it won't hurt you as long as you're living a life before the Lord, a righteous life. Now, I didn't say perfect. Because in the Bible, when you, when you read in James where it says that, you know, we're to, to walk in, in, in the perfection of the Lord, it's talking about maturity. All right? And so, but God wants us to understand the great authority. That's why the enemy is always on the attack. That's why he's always trying to, uh, you know, distract us and, and get us off guard because he doesn't want us operating in our authority. He doesn't want us to know who we are in Christ. He doesn't want us to, because he's afraid of us. So... You know, we have to understand our authority, and that's just, you know, you'll hear us say that over and over again, but we war from a place of victory. I speak to a lot of people about stuff, and a lot of times people are always saying, the devil's after me. No, he's, he, he's only after you if you let him. You need to stand firm, and, you know, I'm not right. That's why, you know, you've heard it said about our armor. We don't have any, any peace in the back of our armor because we're never to run. We stand, and when we've done all the stand, we stand. And he knows when you know what you believe in. And so, again, the devil's not my focus. We're teaching on deliverance. He's not my focus. He's defeated. I worship Jesus. And, you know, my focus is him. But we need to know the strategy of the enemy, don't we, in order to win a war. And that's what this is all about. So, again, the enemy's goal is to harass us, to torment us, to enslave us, to cause you to, to be addicted to drugs and alcohol, and to think that, you know, at one point, you know, it, it was fun partying, right? It, you know, it's a counterfeit affection until it envelops you and tries to take you out. Then it's not fun any longer. But Jesus said, listen, even there, 
I'll meet you right where you're at. He's not complicated. Jesus will meet us right where we're at. And, and you know, the simplest, most holiest prayer is I surrender. Help me. I surrender. I give up. Because I know that's what I did. Because it was, it was either that or I was going to kill myself. I surrender. I, I don't know what else to do. And so in Matthew 16, 18, and 19, this is so good. It says here, and I say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades or death will not overpower it by preventing the resurrection of the Christ. I give you the keys, the authority of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind, forbid, declare to be improper and unlawful on earth will have already been bound in heaven, and whatever you loose, permit, declare lawful on earth will have already been loosed in heaven. Now, this is really important when we're, when we're um, in warfare. We have to know how to bind and loose. We have to understand what our authority is here, okay? So the church, it's where it says here, you know, I, um, he says, on this rock I will build my church. We've heard the word. It's the ecclesia, and that means legislative authority. And it's a political and a governmental term. And, and for Jesus to have given this term means he's given us keys of governmental authority. We can legislate. We have great authority. Our prayers make a difference in our region. And Well, first of all, let's start with our lives, our family, our region, and our nation. But if he can get us to, to think this is a bunch of baloney and that we don't have that kind of authority, he, then that, that's his game plan. We're going to talk about a python spirit here in a minute. And it says here, he has given us complete uh, authority. And he's given us complete authority over what? The gates of hell. And so the church here is pictured as a militant force. And listen, the church has been around. It's essential. The church has been around for 2,000 years, and the devil's not stopping it. It's not happening. And so where it says here, kingdom, that word kingdom in this scripture is basilia, and it means to rule. And no power of darkness that can stop the advancing church that Jesus builds. It means that we are in a kingdom. That, you know, we're there to rule and to reign. And so when it says here it shall be, well, like when we're binding, we're going to talk about binding and loosing in a minute. Now remember what it says. I give you the keys and authority of the kingdom of heaven and whatever you bind. That's what the word is, forbid. What I forbid, I forbid you, Satan, from operating in my life, in my family. I forbid that. Whatever you forbid, declared to be improper and unlawful, will have already been bound in heaven. See, Satan's already been bound in heaven. All right, so you, you have to remember something. So when we're binding, it's already done. He's bound in heaven, it says. But see, if he can lie to us, you know, one of the commentaries said, uh, uh, points out that whatever is bound or loose by the believer is done on that basis that it has been already done in heaven by the Lord himself. And, I mean, that's what the scripture says, okay? So Satan's already bound in heaven. All right, so bind is, in the, the Greek word is dio, D-E-A, and it means to fasten or to tie as with chains. And so when he's bound, literally what it means is that he's inoperable. All right, so he loses his ability to act against us. So when you know your authority and you're binding that spirit, I bind that I forbid you. One time, um, we, we have a friend that we know, and he was in my car, and I'm just learning all this stuff, and, and he really was demonized. He had a lot of issues. And um, I had a song on in my car, and the song happened to be about the power of the blood of Jesus. And all of a sudden, he started manifesting, and I thought, oh, Lord God, I'm driving him. My son's in the back seat. He's around 18 months old, and this guy starts flipping out in the car. And in my mind, you know how the devil works. You know, I'm thinking, like, he's going to put his hand like this and choke me and you know, do one of these things to me. So I looked at him, and I said, I bind you in Jesus' name, and I forbid you from speaking. You be quiet in Jesus' name. And he looks at me, and he went, the whole time, uh, honest to God, the whole time he couldn't talk. I was just as shocked as, I was shocked. <laughs> and our son was laughing in the back seat thinking it was a game. Uh, but I'm like, oh my God, this stuff really works, you know? And I said, I forbid you in Jesus' name. Because in my mind, I'm thinking he's going to just put his hand over and choke me. But you were and driving so, him to a deliverance <clears throat> meeting. So I was going, we were going to go. for deliverance. Got yes. started on the way there. 
So binding is done we, done, we have legal authority, all right? And so we have legal authority to bind, to forbid in Jesus' name. When the enemy, when you have tormenting thoughts, I bind you, I forbid your thoughts, your lies from coming and tormenting me in Jesus' name. I forbid this sickness in Jesus' name. I forbid it. I bind the enemy. We have all authority over that, okay? Now, the word loose is luo, L-U-O, and it's defined to loose anything tied or fastened, to loose or, or um, something that's been bound, to set free, to discharge from prison, to free from bondage or disease held by Satan. So, so what we would do is, Lord, I, you know, we pray, we bind the enemy, and we lose freedom. We lose deliverance. We lose the truth. We lose the power of the word. We, you know, we release the word. So, so it's a binding and loosing process, but we have to understand our authority in this. Now, it's not like you have a little rabbit's foot, like you're going to just uh, shake this thing. It's your authority, knowing who you are in Christ, and that you're a son and a daughter, and he loves you very much. And this, he's saying, listen, I'm, I'm teaching you how to stand because he can't fight all of our battles we have to take a stand I mean, he goes be he sends the angels to go before us in our rear guard but you know it's like when you grow up in a neighborhood you can't always have someone fighting for you you have to stand and fight yourself right so anyway so the victory over demons have already been won by jesus christ right he took the keys away from the enemy so um you know, and just pause and think on that. You have the authority, and I'm sure a lot of you do this already, to bind and loose. Amen? Now, in Luke chapter 13, in 11 through 17, we'll see an example of this. And behold, there was a woman who had a spirit of infirmity 18 years and was bent over and could in no way raise herself up. But when Jesus saw her, he called her to him and said, Woman, you are loose from your infirmity. And he, and he laid hands on her, and immediately she was made straight and glorified God. But the ruler, the religious system of the synagogue, answered with indignation because Jesus had healed her on the Sabbath. And he said to the crowd, listen, there are six days on which men ought to work. Therefore, come and be healed on them and not on the Sabbath day. And so they're giving Jesus a hard time. And Jesus answered him and said, you hypocrite, does not each one of you on the Sabbath loose his ox or donkey from a stall and lead it away to water so ought not this woman being a daughter of abraham whom satan has bound think of itself for 18 years be loosed from this bond on the sabbath yeah. and so this lady first of all when you look up that word infirmity it literally means um it means uh to be delivered from a weakness of the soul so it's, it's this, it, you know, and with this woman's issue, it was her soulless realm. You know what I did? I brought the wrong notes. Oh, well. So anyway, so um, let me read it to you in another version. Um, darn, I had a different version here. Anyway, so you see here that he, he loosed her from the affliction of the enemy. So, it, so she was bound. And this spirit of infirmity had gripped her. She was bent over. So, so in her particular case, her illness was a result of a demon. Now, not all sickness is a result of a demon, but in her particular case. So, you know, so, so when we're praying for people, it's like I bind this spirit of infirmity or this affliction or whatever the spirit of the Lord tells you, and I loose deliverance. I loose healing over you now in Jesus' name. So we have that right to do that. So in Matthew 12, 29, it says, how can, a strong, how can one enter a strong man's house and plunder, spoil his goods, unless he first binds the strong man? We have to bind the strong man. I bind, like when we're doing deliverance, we bind that strong man because he has, you know, uh, it's like a, an army. You know, you have a general, then you have your, 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 you know, lieutenant or your captain. And so anyway, so, so that's how the, the demonic realm operates and so we have to first bind that strong man and then the weaker ones we cast that out and then we get the root the root spirit out okay so it says how can one enter a strong man's house and plunder spoil his goods unless he first binds the strong man and then he will plunder his house and i also typed it out in the amplified how can a person go into a strong man's house and carry off his goods the entire equipment of his house without first binding the strong man then indeed he may plunder the house. And in the King James, it, the plunder there means spoil, to take his spoil or take his plunder. And it literally means to take possession by legal process, all right, to capture. See, the devil is a legalist. 
So we have a legal right, and we have to understand that. So we have this legal process that we can bind and take authority. I forbid you from holding on to what's mine, period. And so, and then, I, you know, we command, uh, you know, the deliverance. And we have this right. It, when, you, when you even study through Scripture, you'll see so many legal terms. Jesus, you know, Holy Spirit, he's our advocate, you know. And, and so you'll see so many legislative terms. And, and so there's a legal process even in the heavenlies that we need to understand and that we have a right in, okay? Everybody good? So what's a strong man? It's a ruling demon that resides in a stronghold, a house with, where lesser demons hide. And, and one of the things that I had, and I, that's what I forgot, I'll have it for you next week. I have all the groupings, I'm sure you've seen them, of different spirits and, and spirits that, that work with him. You know? But it's important for you to see this stuff. And a lot of times when we're going through stuff, in my mind, because I've been doing it for so many years, you know, we, know how, we just take authority and bind whatever the Holy Spirit is telling us. But sometimes we just look at the list and take authority over these things, right? So Jesus taught that a person's freedom is gained through first binding the strong man. I bind the spirit of cancer. I forbid this infirmity from operating in my life. You know, Jesus does, you know, he brings healing into our lives. But sometimes, a lot of times, it's, a, it's a, you know, cancer is a rebellious spirit. And so, you know, we hear with the spirit of the Lord and a strategy, but we war like that. I'm not going to just say, well, you know, it's case or all, Sarah, what am I going to do? I have it. No, I'm going to war in the spirit and pray till God shows me otherwise. And so anyway, so we weaken the enemy when we bind him. And once he's bound, he's unable to act. We take authority over it. And we have seen this over and over and over again. And now, so when we're doing that, you have to understand we confess God's word. Confessing the word of God in this process is really critical. It's really important because even though you're binding, you're taking authority, let's say like, like you've had a stronghold of unbelief or you're struggling with a lot of mental torment of lies of the enemy. Well, he's going to keep shooting those darts, those arrows at you. So how do we combat it? I bind, I take authority, but then you, 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 know, you, you shoot back with the word of God. Here's what the word says. And, and you know what I did, because I couldn't, when I was in the midst of an attack, I couldn't remember a lot of the scriptures. It, it would just, I would just go blank, because you're, you're struggling, you know, you're warring. I had them written out, I mean, now you have all your computers, but I don't like the computer. So I had them all written out on index cards. Script, I mean, I had scriptures all over the place. I still do it to this day. I have notes all over the place of scripture. And it's just what works for me. You have to find what works for you, right? So confessing God's word is an important part of our life. And our mouth is connected to our heart. And when we speak the word, it becomes like a hammer. I love that scripture in Jeremiah. I have it up there. Um, the next one is Jeremiah 23, 29. When we speak the word, picture this. Like, I'm real visual. So when you speak the word, it becomes like a hammer that breaks the rock in pieces, Picture this stronghold, this struggle, this torment, and as you're decreeing the word and you're hitting it and you're hitting, it's shattering. The word is doing that, okay? So Jeremiah 23, 29 says, Is not my word like a fire that consumes all that can endure the test, says the Lord, and like a hammer that breaks in pieces the rock of most stubborn resistance? Oof. Listen, you're battling alcohol addiction, drug addiction, sex addiction, addiction, whatever it is. You decree the word like you would take medicine three times a day, and you bind that spirit. You forbid that spirit of bondage and captivity from taking over you, and you decree the word. I'm telling you, you will see. There's war going on, but if you're determined to get free, I promise you, you'll get set free. I'm not saying it's not without a process. But we need each other. You need the presence of the Lord. That's why you need, it's important that you're in church. It's important that you're in an area where the, you have the presence of the Lord. And so, but see, Jesus died on the cross for our freedom. But he's given us tools, praying in the spirit. That's, that's tools that God's given us. Worshiping is powerful, right? All right, so now we're going to talk. So I wanted to really focus tonight. One of the other things is we bind, we loose. We, we, we. Bind the strong man, and, and we decree the word that it shatters things. But now we're going to just talk quickly about a python spirit. Because this spirit has perme permeated the church. It, and, and, so, and we'll see why. And we're going to talk about other ones, but I just the Lord really had me focus on this one tonight. In, in Acts 16.16, 16, in the Amplified, it says, 
As we were on our way to the place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl who was possessed by a spirit of divination. In the King James, it says Python, claiming to foretell future events and to discover hidden knowledge. And she brought her owners much gain by her fortune telling. The Python spirit, now, oh, all right. So they were on their way to prayer. That's key. And this spirit attacked, all right? So what's the area that's the least attended in churches? Prayer. Prayer. And what, who attacks it the most? Python, the enemy, because he understands the power of prayer. And so Paul's a praying man, and this thing went after him. And so he and Silas, and so they were at the place of prayer. And this python spirit, it's a coiling spirit that works to squeeze the breath of life out of us. It's to cut your, life lo your lifeline to God off. It's, it's, it hates the anointing. And, and even as you're starting to flow, how many times many of you here can say that you started really growing in the Lord, things are going great, and boom, something happens. Catch you off guard, and, and now you're not really, really reading and praying as much because you got so caught up with whatever was going on in your life. You know, it's, there's a strategy that's there, and we have to be aware of it to bind that spirit. And we're going to go through what are some of the characteristics and what this thing does. And so... Um, it, its agenda is to, you know, keep us shrouded in a defeated place, all right? And, and the spirit will remind you of wounds from your past. It will surround you with ungodly influences and, and just to compromise the word. But some of the symptoms, it causes you to be weary, tired, extreme exhaustion, I can't pray. A lot of times you'll be in church and, and you'll see people, and I'll, and I'll listen, some might be on medication, sometimes you might be tired, but if you're always falling asleep in church, that's a problem, okay? I'm sorry, I don't care who's preaching. That might be a spirit, all right? And so, I mean, I see them at times, like, going, going, gone, they're gone, and I'm watching them, so, you know, <laughs> you know who you are. And so, if it's every time, it can, it's probably a spirit, and so it, it, it causes you to lose passion for worship. It causes you to feel pressured and overwhelmed, helpless and hopeless. And you just, when, like you know you're supposed to have the zeal of the Lord, you know you're to have passion, but it's like, oh, I don't know. And it attacks everyone, I'm just saying. It doesn't mean you're in sin either. But we have to recognize this strategy and not just get into that feeling, I'm so tired. Listen, if I could have stayed home tonight, I probably would have. You know, you just feel tired. You know, you don't feel like going out, right? It happens to us all. And so, um, but, and, and it wants you to lose your passion for Jesus. And so the word divination in this verse comes from the Greek word P-U-T-H-O-N, which translate in English as python. So Vine's Dictionary explains how Greek mythology believed the Pythian or Pythian serpent guarded the oracle of Delphi unto Apollo slew it, and then took on the name Pythian. The word was later applied to diviners or soothsayers inspired by Apollo. And so the enemy knows that um, ha how to go about it. So they're on their way to prayer, and the enemy's goal is to choke our prayer life. You, you don't pray, or you start to pray, and you have 14 distractions, or your computer, or someone's texting you. That's a strategy. And then you seem to never move forward. You never get ahead. That's a strategy of the enemy. But then you have to be slick and say, no, I'm not going to keep my computer or my phone near me. I'm going to shut everything down, and I'm not moving, and I'm going to pray. So you have to have a discipline and be determined to do that as well. Because think about the things you're crying out for. God's like, I want to give you that download. I want to give you the direction. I want to give you what you're crying out for. All right? And the enemy also knows that our mind is a point of logic, and it's always trying to, uh, you know, have you reason everything out or bring confusion. You know? And so what's the Bible say in Proverbs 23, 7? As a man thinketh, so is he. Right? And so he wants you to always second-guess things, and he wants to pollute our minds with things, you know? So he can attack anyone. Remember, Paul was a man of prayer. Right. And so... Um, anyway, so despite Paul's relationship with Jesus, he had a strong law, real, uh, prayer life. But he had to wrestle against this thing. And then here we have this, this young girl saying, these are men of God. These, you know, 
They're, they're men. They're wonderful men of God. Listen, you can have people saying the right things, blessing and praising the Lord, and they have a devil inside them, and their motive is wrong. And you have to discern that. And he knew it. Because if you're just reading it, it seems like, well, what's Paul's problem that he got mad at her? See, he's saying these are men of the most high God. But he discerned the demon that was in her. And so uh, he took authority over that thing. And, of course, you know, the whole town went in an uproar because that, that was a territorial demon that was in that area that was working, operating through her. So Python had a stronghold in Philippi. And when they were headed to that house of prayer, the spirit launched its attack against him. And it was a distraction that was that it was a distraction for Paul and Silas to get off course. That was the main goal. And so Python knew it had no authority in that city because of prayer. And the more people pray and decree and legislate and worship, the, that's, that's one of the ways you overthrow these things. So what is he going to do? Get everybody tired, get everybody dis, disjointed and not coming out, and not even in your own time? Because he understands the power. See, right. we have to get a revelation right. of that and really recognize what God wants to do through us. And so I love this. And I, it's not on the, I didn't put it up there, but... In Psalm 18, I wrote this out, 34. If you read the whole Psalm 18, it's phenomenal. It says, he trains my hands for war so that my arm bends a bow of bronze. And, Lord, you have given me the shield of your salvation. Remember, deliverance, rescuer, you know, uh, protection, freedom. Your right hand has held me up in your greatness. Your gentleness has made me great. See, he's training our hands for war right now. Right. So that we, our arm, our, our authority, our spiritual arm will bend a bow of bronze and that and that's what god wants us to do he he doesn't want us to be distracted there's a full blown trial that's aimed to take us out of our purpose and destiny and i'm telling you and the lord's like listen i you're crying out and i want to give you the downloads i want to give you the direction but you're not hearing me you're not waiting on me they that wait upon the lord their strength shall be renewed like the eagles remember they that wait we have to wait we have to listen it, it, again, it's, I'm telling you, what the Lord's been saying to me, it's, it's no longer, I mean, he's a God of mercy and grace. He really is. He loves us so much. But, but time is short, and we can't straddle the fence. We can't. We have to go full on board. It's either you're hot or cold. You're gonna, it's, it's not going to be pretty. So Python would rather you lick your wounds than pray for healing. Python would rather you complain or gossip than you take your problems to a miracle-working God. He would rather distract you with your attacks and your persecutions and, and rather than you press in for deliverance. We can get so caught up in what's wrong that we stop praying to God. We just want to talk about our problems. That's not good, right? So his ultimate goal is to put us, keep us in bondage and thwart us from the presence of the Lord and our purpose. And again, like I said, and it could just cut off our lifeline to God. So, and it wants you to just go through the motions, where you're not gaining any traction. And I said, uh-uh, Lord, that is going to stop. <clears throat> Imagine, remember, we're the Gideon 300 army. We're the ones that are moving forward. We're the ones that have the, the call of God, the vision. And it's like, remember, it can happen to anyone. Paul was a man of prayer. <laughs> right? So it happens to us all. And so... God wants us to know that, that there's, there's a strategy for us. And how do, we, how do we get loose from this grip of the enemy, right? So, so, you know, Paul took authority. He got ticked off with this girl, and he cast that demon out of her. And, and her masters now, the, the Bible says that they can no longer profit because she was working witchcraft, right? And so they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace and uh, to the authorities, and they beat them. A lot of times when you're taking a stand, it's not that we're going to physically get beaten, but you never know nowadays the way it's going. But, but, um, but, but you know, the enemy comes up at you. And even Christians will come against you. Oh, here they go with the devil stuff again. Here they go with, you know, that, you know they'll make fun of it and mock it. But, but, you know, I tell you the truth, the ones who have mocked it have called me on the phone asking me to help them when their demons were manifesting. Right, Easter? So. Uh, just saying. Just saying. 
So, you know, remember in 2 Chronicles 20, 20, when all hell was breaking loose, when all the, the, the enemy, all the kings were coming against them, they cried out to God, they fasted and they prayed, and the, the strategy was worship. And, and he says, listen, the battle will be mine. The battle is the Lord's. Yeah, there you go. And so, you know, and they worship. Why do you think there's such an attack against worship? How many people don't come to worship? Because it's intimate. They don't like it. But listen to me. It's a strategy to come against the works of the enemy. Praying in his spirit. Oh, they're too loud. Well, yeah, we're going to be loud. You know, listen, this is a strategy that the Lord has given us to overthrow the works of the enemy. Who cares? You go to rock concerts, right? Did you play football? Did you watch a football game this weekend? So, you know, that's okay though, right? But that's not being too fanatical. So anyway, so they cast a demon out of her, but then they got, you know, in a little trouble. They were thrown into jail. And they were falsely accused, had their clothes torn off, were beaten with rods and thrown into prison with stocks on, with stocks on their feet. And so Python pressures you to make you not want to do anything. <laughs> Not pray, not praise, but God is saying to us, he's given us the strategy. So what's the strategy? Well, the strategy, well, first of all, let me just give you some guidelines about the discerning the attack, okay? So, so as I said earlier, you feel really tired. You can, it makes you feel overwhelmed. Sometimes, like, I can just be like, oh, my God, I, I just, I don't know. I'm so confused. I feel so overwhelmed. I don't want to pray. I don't know what's the, did anybody, does that ever happen to anybody here, right? Hello? And so, because um, remember, he's after the anointing. It partners with a religious spirit. To them, where it wants you to feel intimidated. Because, like, if you start telling someone that you're taking a strong stand for Jesus and, you know, oh, you're so fanatical. Oh, my God, don't be ridiculous now. You know, these crazy, you know, Christians have to worship for one hour and worship. The, you know, tell them to shut up. Because they're not the ones that are helping you get through this. Jesus is. And so the thing is, I thought to myself, because I remember tell, people telling me, my one friend said to me, said to me you are so corny and ridiculous. This is what she said to me. I said, but you're taking seven quaaludes, bouncing walls, and I'm corny, okay? I said, no, I'm getting, I'm free, <laughs> and I'm corny. And so, but, you know, and I, and I thought to myself, you're, you're making fun of me, and I'm getting my life right, and you're making fun of me. See, that's how the enemy will, will mock you, and, and, and they, but they all wind up getting saved, just saying. Anyway, so it comes against the move of God. It hates revival. It hates awakening. First of all, we have to have revival within our own selves. It has to, uh, we have to have that awakening, that renewal within ourselves. See, it wants to distract us. We're always talking. We're always doing this other stuff. It's enough is enough. So God wants us to wake up. And so the symptoms, extreme re, uh, exhaustion, constriction, a lot of times what's happened is even uh, with this python spirit, what I've realized through the years, a lot of people get respiratory issues and, um, you know, throat attacks. And, you know, and just, it just comes against you. But you have to just say, you know, Lord, I'm praising you. I'm going to worship you no matter what. I'm not giving into it. And, and I'll call my friends up. I'll say, look, I don't know what's wrong with me, but I need help right now. I just feel out of it. I don't want to pray. I don't want to read. I don't want to do anything. I know when I'm getting attacked like that. And you get help. You ask me. That's why we all need each other. And we just pray. Don't be ashamed of it. It's like, you know what? I'm struggling right now, and I need help. And so and we pray. So what did he do? What were they doing in prison? They started worshiping. They were praising Jesus. Who in the world? Think about this, because they knew the strategy. They, they, had, they were beaten. Their feet were in stocks. You know, like, I don't know how, you know, how, I'm sure it was very uncomfortable, right? And plus they were beaten in a stinking little cell. It's not like the prison cells now. I've been, we've been to Israel, and it's, they were little manhole kind of cells. It was just really tight, dirty, dung was in there. It was just disgusting. And so probably bugs and rats, ugh. You know, so probably a lot of creepy things in there. But they worshipped. They worshipped. 
They said, devil, you are not going to get me in the place of defeat. I'm going to worship Jesus because that is the thing that will take him out. Lord, I'm going to worship you. They probably prayed in the spirit. Paul was writing half of the epistles. So I'm sure he was decreeing the word of the Lord, releasing whatever was there and decreeing it and just going at it. And what happened? The prison door opened. Our prison doors will open up when we take that stand. They were worshiping. And not only that, the people in there were listening to them, and they were getting set free. See, God, the enemy wants us to so focus on the defeat or the hopelessness or our struggles and we'll never get ahead. But God's saying, worship me. Get your eyes fixed on me because I'll break you out of that prison door that you don't think that you could ever get free from. Many of us standing here, we're bound as could be, but Jesus set us free, didn't he? And so, but that's what I want to encourage you. So it's, it's, it's not anything that we don't know, but we go through these cycles and the enemy tries to hold us back. And so we have to recognize the strategy. So when you get in that place, start worshiping. Start decreeing the word of the Lord. Have stuff already written out that you know is your go-to that you can just start decreeing it. If you don't remember it, because there are a lot of times when, I, I don't know about you, but when I was in that place, I, it's just like I draw a blank. I mean, I know I can worship, but I would draw a blank. So I would have my stuff ready. And then, I, then it was like, you know, getting the motor all revved up and you start going. Then, you, then it's like, okay, now watch out. Yeah. <laughs> so, so anyway, so I just want to encourage you with that and know that you have the greater one in you. In 1 John 4, 4, it says, greater is he that's in you <clears throat> than he that's in the world. Than anything that the enemy is trying to release against us. Anything. Any, any spirit of python, spirit of divination, it works with the witchcraft spirit. You know, any spirit that's there that would try to come against us. What about if you're struggling with depression? What about, I mean, that was something, or fear. I bind the spirit of fear. I take authority over all worry, all anxiety, all fear. I take authority over it. I bind it in Jesus' name. When you're, when you're battling with confusion, I bind confusion. So if you're battling with depression... I would have to, I would start worshiping, but I would bind the spirit. Now, when you're in that place of depression, you don't have strength. You don't feel as though you have strength. You don't want to do anything. But, but there's, there's a strength of God in us. And it's like, I'm going to do, I don't care if it's one scripture, I'm going to worship, but I'm going to call and get help. But, see, we can do self-deliverance, but then there's times that you just need to come into a meeting. We have to look you in the eye and cast that thing out of you. And so, and that's Okay. But, you know, once you're set free from that, you know how to, you know, you, the Bible says, so what we have to be careful of is that when we get deliverance, we want to keep our house clean. And that's through worship. That's through living a clean and pure and holy life, you know. God wants, listen, the church, there's people struggling with pornography and sexual issues, all this transgender stuff, and the boy saying he's a girl, the girl saying, listen, there's deliverance that's going to be needed. There's deliverance. We have to know how to flow in this. And, I, and, and I'm not... You know, these people are struggling. They're hurting. And the Lord wants to set them free. Yeah. There's such confusion that's going. But in our prayer time, we can be binding that spirit, taking authority of this spirit that has gotten a hold of the world. It's an antichrist structure and it's spirit of error. It, it just brings such confusion. There's such perversion and deception. And, there's, and we'll talk about this, a Baal spirit, a B-A-A-L, a Baal spirit that works with Jezebel, Jezebel's underneath Baal, that, that's releasing all this perversion and this sexual sin that's out there. There's nothing new under the sun. There was just as much perversion when Paul the Apostle and all those guys were doing their thing. You know, and they turned the world upside yeah. down. But see, we can't be wishy-washy. We can't be a carnal church, seeker-friendly. I'm a God-friendly church. That's who we are. We're gonna, we have a fear of the Lord, not a fear of man. We're not here to please man. We're here to please the Lord. Because, listen, if, as crazy and messed up as I was, if I was involved with a church that was fearing man, I would still be bound. I probably would have killed myself already. So I needed people that knew the word, knew deliverance, knew how to worship, knew how to break through, knew how to pray, knew how to travail. And that's what God is saying to us. We, have, we can't allow our emotions and, and, and just the strategies of the enemy to hold us back. 
the enemy, I'm, we're not going to allow him, his, his, you know, he has a strategy. God says in Jeremiah that I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper and have an expected end. But so does he have a strategy and a plan for each and every one. But I don't know about you, but I say no to his strategy. And that's up to us to say no because, Lord, I yield to you and I surrender to your plans and purposes for my life. It's a wonderful thing. And believe me, I was an atheist. I didn't believe. I thought, I thought like the mockers, I understood the mockers because I was one of them. I thought it was that people were crazy. And, and until then, I thought, well, I'm about to take my life. I really would, and I'm not minimizing that. I didn't care if I lived or died. And I, I just was so, just so many things were going on, right? And then I thought, what do I have to lose? And so it wasn't by just doing things halfway. It was either, listen, if you're going to party and sin, you partied and sin, right? So now we're going to do things half backwards when we're saved? No, we'd have to go, all, we're either all in or not. And so I just want to encourage you to be all in. Uh, Lord, I'm going to do whatever it takes, 100% sell out to you and, 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 and be a fanatic for Jesus, yeah. addicted to Jesus. That's the only way. And, and that was the thing that was a turning point. And I know many of you can come up here and share your testimonies of how God set you free. But that's what the Lord wants. And that's what, he, that's what the world needs. And listen, deliverance is the greatest ministry of the love of God. Amen. It's not a judgmental, put you down, make fun of oh God. No, it's the love of God in action. Yeah. Because you want to see people delivered and set free and not live in pain and turmoil. Yeah. My God, we know what that's like. Yeah. We know the pain. We know the counterfeit affections of drugs and, and alcohol and everything else that we try to appease in ourselves and to try to go after things that will make us happy. It, nothing will make us happy unless we bow our knee to Jesus. And, so, and then we do in his way. That's why he died on the cross for us. And so, um, so anyway, so I want to encourage you. And I'm going to pray a prayer with you. I wrote out if I can only understand my handwriting. Um, uh, about just binding Python. All right, and, um, and so we're going to pray, and, and keep this in your prayers, too, because even pray for the churches. Pray in our church. Pray that, that people are, will break out of lethargy, because that's the goal of the Spirit, to cause you to be apathetic and lethargic in the things of the Lord. That's not who we are to be. Amen? Right. So come on, I'm going to ask you to stand, and we're going to close. Oh, the, no, no, then see right now, hon. Yeah. I just felt like it'd be important to point something out. Can you turn uh, your Bible? Just Acts chapter 16. This is kind of where Trisha was a little earlier. If you want to just put it up on the screen, it would be um, verse, start with verse 6. I have New King James. Um, so verse 6 says, Now when they had gone through Phrygia and the region of Galatia, they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia. <laughs> right okay so what does that mean forbidden by the holy spirit like that means they were praying and they had their eyes open and they were listening to the lord and they knew how to discern the voice of the lord because why would the holy spirit stop them from preaching you know on, in the natural in your carnal flesh you'd say well that can't be god well wait a minute no his ways are high above our ways and when you learn how to recognize his voice you listen after they had come to missia they tried to go on to Bithynia, but the Spirit did not permit them. How many times have we walked past signals that the Lord is trying to show us and give us because our, our logical mind kicks in and we forget that that's pride often. And if we're not praying, that's a sin. It's called, it's called the sin of prayerlessness in the Old Testament. Lord forbid that I would commit the sin to not pray for you, is what Samuel said. <laughs> Right? So be careful. The Spirit did not permit them. So passing Missy, they came down to Troas in verse 9, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night. Well, okay, so he's alert in the Spirit, isn't he? He was alert enough to listen the first time and not go to Asia. He's forbidden a second time, and now a third time he's seeing a vision. And a man of Macedonia stood and pleaded with him, saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. And Philippi is in Macedonia. All right, so there was no churches there. There was no Christian influence there. The first church in that region was in Philippi, 
right? But the first thing that happened, as Trisha pointed out, was that they cast a demon out of that girl. And it looked like everything was going bad. And if we weren't praying enough, what would we say? Oh, my God, we missed it. We should have went to Asia. It must have been the devil saying that to us. No, I don't think he ever thought that. What happened? He ends up getting put in jail. And Trisha talked about getting, you know, praying. And, and, and then right after that, it was an earthquake when they were worshiping in the, in the prison. And who came in? Do you remember who came into the cell? The jailer. And then what happened with the jailer? He said, what must I do to be saved? <laughs> because if, if the Romans find out that, that this jailbreak happened, I'm dead. So how are you going to get me out of this mess? And he gets saved. And then they go baptize him, and they baptize his whole family, and that becomes the first church in that whole region, the jailer. So think about it. Maybe the jailer was the guy that Paul saw in the vision, saying, we need you to come over here. And the jailer probably didn't even know that that was happening, but in the spirit, you, you really have to take this seriously, that we live in the natural world, but we're not of the natural world. We have to be in, in the spirit world. So... My, my tie into that was while I was sitting there, I was thinking what it was like when I was doing drugs. And that was 10 years of my life from the time I was 15 to 25 years old, which was a long time ago now. But it flashed back to me what it was like. And, and basically, it's just like a lot of other people, it was designed to medicate pain. I didn't know how to handle the pain I was in. And look, in the beginning, it was, they called it social lubrication. You know, if you're the football player and you're the captain of the team and, you know, you're supposed to be dating the pretty girls and you got to fill this role that the world gives you. So if you're a little reluctant or shy, have a little alcohol. Lubricate yourself socially. And now you get this fake courage of alcohol, which goes away with the hangover the next morning real quickly. I promise that. But then it just changed to different drugs besides alcohol. But it was always a counterfeit. And the more I did drugs, the more pain I had in my life because the bad mistakes I made, which made me want to do the drugs more. Because the more pain you have, the more you have to medicate your pain. And then you need more and more medication. And then a tragedy hit my life, and I really didn't know how to handle that. So the devil had me in a really bad spot. And if it wasn't for getting saved and stopping that, then I don't think I'd be alive right now. And there's probably other people here or watching that are in that same boat. So why am I telling you all this? Is because you might be medicating your pain right now, but not just with drugs. It could be a million other things. It could be video games. It could be food. It could be a lot of things that are even legal, but, but are just being overplayed and overdone in order to escape what the Lord wants you to face. So when you think of Paul being tuned in enough to know not to go to Asia, to go to Macedonia, to call a spirit out of a girl who was saying, these men are the men of God. That was another thing he had to be alert enough to say, I don't need the devil giving me my commercials. I don't need your promotion. I want to be undercover for a while, right? So there's a spirit to mention and, and addictions. I mean, the reason fasting is so valuable is because it causes you to break the routine. And if there's some routine in your life and you think, well, I don't really have a problem in that area, try to stop. And if you can't stop, you have a problem in that area. Oh, but it's only coffee. It's, it's legal. Yeah, but you can't stop. That's a problem. And that's the devil that wants to keep you separated from your full awareness in the spirit. Only a little bit of alcohol. Look, and it's not a sin to drink, but it's a sin to be drunk. No doubt about it. In the Bible, you can find it. It's easy to find. It's a sin. Don't do it. Why? Because you're not in your, in your right mind. And, you know, how many women have gotten pregnant because they had too much to drink, right? And it wasn't the alcohol. It was the guy. But the, their guard was, was dropped. They weren't of the right mind, and they were taken advantage of. Think of that spiritually. When, when you're not in your right mind, the devil can come in and take advantage of you, right? So you need to guard yourself. You need to, to be diligent about your gates and what's coming in your eyes and your ears. And I'm, I'm just recommending a fast for anybody that's struggling with any kind of addiction. That's what an addiction is. It's a behavior that you can't stop. 
And God can help you stop that thing, okay? So can I just pray? I just want to pray a, a blanket prayer. You don't have to raise your hand. But if anybody here or watching is dealing with an addiction, we have the power and the authority to break that addiction. And you have to ask the Lord for the supernatural strength that he can give you, right? It's, it's listed as fruit of the Holy Spirit is self-control and temperance. What we can't do in our own strength, he gives us the strength to do. So start by making the decision that you're going to try. And once you try, it's not your willpower that's going to do it. It's your submission and your surrender. And if, if it's a fast of food, you're not going to die. Okay? I'll just tell you that right now. You have enough reserve that you won't die, even though the devil will tell you you're going to die. And if it's breaking habits, there's, there's really practical things that we can help you with to get you to just shift into a new mindset and create new habits. Because it, you only have to be off by two degrees, and you end up, you know, six months later, you're going in the complete wrong direction if it's two degrees a day, right? You want to be zoomed in exactly what God is saying to you every day. So that we take authority over addiction right now, authority over that python that would try to squeeze the breath out of us and keep us in that counterfeit mode. We don't, we don't want to follow the enemy's voice. You said that your sheep know your voice and, and a stranger we will not follow. So help us take those words, Lord, literally, that we won't follow the voice of the enemy when he's trying to tell us to medicate our pain. We will not go to drugs. We will go to the throne room, and we will bring our needs to you. And you said we could cast our cares upon you because you care for us, that there's nothing that we can't bring to you that you won't help us with if we're just open enough to just bring it to you honestly. So help us, Lord. Help us. Give us the grace, the supernatural ability to do in your power what we can't do in our own willpower, in Jesus' name. Amen. And, and the other thing that I was thinking of when my husband was talking is um, that we can be addicted to negative self-talk. We can be addicted to just negative behavior. And so, or, you know, just always murmuring and complaining can be addicted to that. So, right? But when we went to Israel, right before we went to Israel, Trisha said, I want you all to do a fast from negative speaking. Every time you try, and it wasn't related to the Israel trip, it just was coincidental. So we go to Israel, and a bunch of stuff starts happening while we're there. And, and everybody on the trip was starting to murmur and complain a little bit. Legitimate reasons, but we're like, you got to hear her message. She said you got to fast from that negative speaking. It's amazing how often you'll catch yourself if you try to do that on, on all the different ways you could look at something. We kind of default to that mm, whiny, you know, complaining mode and we know God doesn't like that <laughs> so Lord we just bind Python the spirit of by Python and we forbid it from being in operation in our lives in our home and in our church Lord we bind that spirit that would just want to put everybody to spiritual sleep mm -hmm. we take authority over you now in Jesus name we loose the joy of the Lord we loose the strength of God we loose revelation. We loose a hunger for the Lord. Father, we loose a hunger to pray and to worship, oh God. And Lord, where there, if there's any area where we have been compromising, any area, Father, where, where we have just aligned ourselves with that spirit, we renounce Python spirit. We come out of agreement with it. And Lord, we surrender to you. We repent for listening to the lies of the enemy. And, Lord, we just thank you for deliverance, Father. We thank you for the power of the blood of Jesus. And, Lord, we thank you that we will not, we make a declaration tonight that we will not be hindered by a spirit of python. It will not cause us to get off course. We forbid that from happening. Lord, we thank you that in Holy Spirit we give you permission to just check our hearts when, when if we're under the influence. If it's just, it's little at a time it comes in. It's ever yeah. so, so soft and so light it comes in. It doesn't come in like a bulldog. Mm -hmm. And so, Lord, let us be aware. Let us discern. We thank you that we are a people of discernment, keen discernment. We see in the spirit. We hear in the spirit realm because yeah. we're supernatural beings. So, Father, we break off lethargy over us. We break off stagnancy, a slothful spirit. We take authority over it, and we loose again, oh, God, your wisdom and your strategy, your discernment, that we are watchmen, that we are people who watch and hear, and we are alert in the realm of the spirit. And, Lord, I loose the power of your blood, and I thank you, Father, for our deliverance and that we are warring people who hear your voice. We are your sheep. 
We are your children. We are your sons and daughters whom you love, that you will guide. You will go before us and be a rear guard. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. 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 Praise God.